Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Velasquez. As Metropolitan Community College's Coordinator of International Intercultural Education, it is my pleasure to welcome you to another program in the College's Diversity Matters Film and Lecture Series. Your microphones will be silenced during this presentation. The opportunity to engage in conversation will occur after the screening. You also will have chat access to contact the hosts of the meeting, but not your fellow audience members. So it is fine to send questions or comments to the host that can be integrated into the discussion. Your continued attendance at international intercultural education programming could qualify you for recognition throughout the year. To be considered, complete the online evaluation and include your name and contact information. The online address will be on a slide at the end of the program and also in the chat it is mccneb.edu slash IIEEVAL. Today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Naomi Mardak Uman, who will introduce our film and lead a discussion after the screening. Naomi Mardak Uman is the Director of Faculty Development at Metropolitan Community College. She also coordinates Metro's Language and Literacy Center, which provides academic support to students who have learned English as an additional language. She earned her doctorate in educational studies from UNL in 2018 and has over 15 years of experience teaching courses in ESL and more recently, higher education administration. Naomi is passionate about creating inclusive instructional environments that center the success of traditionally underserved students. Please welcome Dr. Naomi Mardak Uman, who will introduce Still Waters. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to view and to discuss this film in community. Still Waters is a film about a teacher, about his small school, about his students, it's an after school program really, as you'll see um, with some Saturday and summer activities. And this small school seems to have an outsized impact on the students that it serves. A little bit of context for you. The students are primarily Latino, many from families who are relatively recent immigrants to the US. And the film was shot in 2016 during the lead up to that year's presidential election. So there's some important backdrop to what's happening within the school. Following the film, we'll have a brief time for discussion. Um, and I have a few questions for you to consider as you view the film and that we can use as a springboard for our discussion. I'm gonna share those with you here so you can see them. And then we'll have them in the chat during the film too. So you can refer to them. So first, um, while you'll discover that the film is not at its heart just about this school um, and about his educational philosophy, so Stephen Haft is the, the founder, um, the teaching methods that he uses are remarkable and they're certainly not anything that I ever experienced as a student and never like anything that I used as a teacher. So I'm interested in hearing after the film what you make of these methods. Um, think about what stands out for you at at the school, what they do together. Think about the teaching methods, the materials, um, the interactions between the students themselves um, and between the students and the teachers. And what, why do you think these methods seem to be so effective with the students? Second, as I mentioned, Still Waters was filmed in 2016 um, during the campaign for the presidential election of that year. Then candidate Donald Trump doesn't appear in the film, but we do hear his voice. We hear audio clips of campaign speeches from that election season at several points in the film. So one thing you might think about is what role does that backdrop, that political climate play in the film? And more importantly, what role does it play in the lives of the students and their families? You can, might consider the election and the campaign speeches in the context of the Im immigrant background of the students uh, and their families. You'll hear a little bit about the gentrification of the neighborhood they live in. 
because this political climate does have a, a real strong role in the film. So I'd like you to consider that as you watch. Um, and finally, the three and four kind of go together. The film is titled uh, Still Waters, and that's after the school. The whole name of the school is Still Waters in a Storm. And after watching it, the first time I thought a lot about the name of the school. It's not really a typical name for a school, right? It's, it's probably not something that the founder, Stephen Hack, came up with randomly or lightly. So uh, Still Waters. Of course, you can think of Still Waters as a, a refuge, a place of safety, a place of rest. Um, from a storm. So what exactly is the storm that Stephen Half hopes to provide a sense of safety and refuge from? What troubles, what hardships um, do the students and the teachers and Stephen Half himself face that they might need refuge from? So finally, consider what storms are present in the lives of the students, the families and the teachers. I think you'll, whether you watch this from the perspective of a student yourself or as a teacher or a parent or just a citizen of our country or a resident of our country, I think you can come up with lots of storms that uh, the folks in the film have to face. And then in what ways does the school provide refuge, provide safety and arrest for the people in, in the movie? So I look forward to hearing your thoughts after the film. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'll see you in an hour or so. Okay, welcome back. Take just kind of a minute to come back to uh, your thoughts here. I invite you, we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes here this afternoon. If you're comfortable, if you're able, turn on your cameras for the conversation. Of course, that's up to you, but um, it's always nice to see folks as we talk. Um, so, so I'm a teacher, and of course, the first lens that I experienced this film through was that of a teacher. But especially watching this a few times now, um, what I realize is that's probably not the most salient um, lens that every you know that everyone uses through, but it's it's really the entryway that the film provides us to right to talking about these larger issues. So let's start there. Let's talk about teaching and learning in this film, um, and then I think that will lead us uh, into some of these other probably larger and, and definitely more important um, topics as we go through. So again, let's start there. What struck you, other than small children reading John Milton? What struck you about teaching and learning at Stillwaters. And anybody can jump in. <laughs> can I say something? Hi. Um, hi. Um, I think the part that is uh, more striking for me is uh, to know that the uh, kids feel that they're not alone here. Um, and I, I experienced that before. Um, and let me tell you a little bit. When I came here, the first time I came, my country was in war. The first time I came, my mom brought me and the rest of my siblings stay. When I went to school, um, I was pushed. Um, I cried all the time and I did not feel belong. And that was just the barrier of language and uh, being misplaced. Since I had the experience of being from one place to another also, that's part of the misplacing. But uh, these kids that come in, in um, the part that did, I, I feel that it's amazing that this person is making then realize that they're belong. That's very important. It, it gives me ideas of how um, to help others. And, and not only for children, but also adults. They feel like that when they come and they have uh, barriers of even housing, food, uh, lack of resources, and many other things that they need. So it's, it's, it's amazing that we can teach them that they belong, have, have a place for them so they feel belong. It's, it's beautiful. I love it. 
me too. Thank you for sharing that, Noemi. Naomi, can I say something? This is Robert Megan. Am Hi, Robert. I? Okay. Uh, on the one hand, you know, I'm from Kentucky. I grew up in a small town in Kentucky, 350 people. Uh, what until I got to the ninth grade that we went to, they let us, uh, I was about the third uh, class uh, from the segregated school that, that went to a call. They still call it the white school today. It's, it's still known as the white school, not the, uh, you know, and, and I was among about the third class of, of black students that were allowed to to go to, to the white school. We were consistently, you know, uh, told that we didn't belong. We had one English teacher who would, Mrs. Reeves, she would, uh, every once in a while, she would come to class and she have a newspaper from some crazy white ring person. And I remember several times she, she came and she says, I'm gonna read this story, to read this article. And she read this article, some PhD who had did a study and proven unequivocally that black kids cannot compete with white kids and so on. And they did this study and so, uh, and she would go on to say, uh, you know, uh, you don't deserve to be here because your parents don't tip, don't pay taxes. And she says, and she would, she would go on and on about how black parents uh, didn't pay taxes and and shouldn't be allowed to go to the school and so on. But that was a consistent thing throughout the school. Uh, um, so you know, uh, you know, when we got ready to graduate. No black kids were, 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 were advised to try to go to college. We were, all, we were all told we are not college material. You can't go to college, you can't make it in college and so on. So, and, and you know, it's been, I left there in, in 71. So, and I haven't been back, I went in the Air Force and stuff. And so I'm not, I can't attest to what uh, things are like today there. Uh, uh, but uh, but that's my upbringing and my background. I have since become an absolute uh, 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 fan of public schools. I believe uh, any effort to take away from public schools does a disservice to public schools. Uh, uh, when you asked me what, I think, I, get, I think the question here was, uh, what struck you about teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. Well, what struck me was, was at first, what kind of school is this? What is this? Where is, where is it at? And so on. And he finally got to that and explained that it is the school that he's trying to start and so on, and he uh, is doing. I think he could make just as good an impact if he went if he if he uh, got a job at a public school and taught his philosophy at that school. I think he could make just as big an impact. Uh, I don't know. That's that was my take. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Robert. Others? I was really impressed with, he opened with, we're teaching joy. Um, he also encouraged everyone in the class to talk about how they feel. You know, how are you feeling today? Write these things down. Um, because a lot of them are experiencing strife. And I don't ever remember, I don't ever remember school being joy to me or it's okay to, to write down or talk about your emotions. And then 
of course, coming from a family with two teachers, um, something that he said really impacted me, and I know it impacts learning, which was he, he didn't want to teach things that were measured because there are so many things that school brings to your life, your success, that cannot be measured. And it's, it's almost a, a very forward-thinking epiphany that you don't have to measure everything. And um, listening is healing. So there, there are many impactful things that I think I'll remember going forward as, as how learning works and how people can be successful. I was struck by that too, Gina. I, I even wrote it down the second time. Um, no tests, no homework, no pressure, no stress, no bullies. I almost don't recognize an educational environment without those things. That, that unfortunately would be a descriptor of almost every, at least part of that, right? Of every school environment that I've ever been in. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree completely. Gina, no. can I say that, you know, uh, it's very few days I remember in my childhood when I wasn't hungry, when in my home, in, in, at, at, at home. You were saying that school to you was, was not a place that you enjoyed. School for me was a safe, uh, comfortable and then when we in the wintertime we lived in this old shack that uh, uh, back in but way back in the woods and and, and rats infected and i got bit on the finger one time by a rat and, and they thought i was going to lose my finger because it got infected and stuff when i don't know 10 12 years old school for me was a was a safe place i knew i was going to get something to eat uh, when I was at school, um, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, and and I guess that's my vision of school. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, you know, we we our life our lives uh, our lived lives are, you know. What brings us to where we are today, right? And so I guess I don't know. But that, when you said that, it just, it, I just had to express it. You know, my lived experience is totally different. I, you know, I, school is a is a good place for me, and I always wanted to go to school. I was always sad when I couldn't go to school. Uh, uh, um, so, you know. well, I was going to jump in and say. Uh, what I get from this, there's a lot, you know, and a lot that will grow. Yeah. But the, the comfort that he gives kids in after school and around school times gives them the energy to make it through the parts of school that are difficult. Aside from comfort if home is a bad place, right? There's still going to be challenges at school for everybody. So, I mean, that's where I feel like Yes, he could be a great teacher in the school system, but he he did it before and it, it wasn't right for him. It wasn't helping him. And he has to feel good about himself in order to do the things he's doing anyway. Um, so I think there's a big place in the world for after school and Saturday activities. And, and I, I really loved seeing what he was able to do. Yeah. Really for, for the teacher, for Stephen Camp, Still Waters was his place of safety and refuge too. He he talked about his own struggles with mental illness, mm -hmm. the how unsafe he felt at his teaching position in school. So he also created a, a place where he belonged, right, and where he felt comfortable and safe, um, not just for the students. So I thought that was um, that was nice. Let's we don't have too much time, so I would like to get your take on a couple other pieces here. As I mentioned at the beginning, we sort of enter the people's lives in the film through teaching and learning, right, through this school. But always in the background of this film is what's happening outside, right, with the presidential election, um, the gentrification of the neighborhood, the racism that the students experience. experience. Um, any thoughts on that? What, what did you hear? What did you, connections that you make with the film here? 
We're in a similar uh, run up to an election right now. I was surprised, I was taken aback that the kids were so informed. <laughs> they seem to be so informed about uh, 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 Donald Trump. <laughs> For me, I think um, that school is a safe place was an important theme throughout the video that, um, you know, as things became more and more threatening outside of that space, the kids found that space and the parents saw that space as a more and more valuable because it was a safe place for their kids to express their emotions. It was a positive place, a non-judgmental place. Um, and I think what Naomi said a few minutes ago that he created that space, not only for the kids, but for himself. And I think we all try to do that. We all try to create safe spaces for ourselves. Um, but I think as a teacher, our first priority has to be to create a safe place for our students. And so I really liked what he said about the vertical learning rather than the horizontal learning, that that was an important um, thing, important statement for me to hear. Because uh, it, and it was about letting go of some of that teacher control, if you will, and, le and learning from the kids and hearing from the kids and learning from their perspective of what was going on outside. It was very powerful when the one little boy came in and just said, you know, he says this, 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 and this, and it's just not true. You know, we're not all drug dealers. Um, so that's my two cents. Yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Anybody else who hasn't uh, contributed yet? Anything to add? So Amy, I see you popped up there again. Okay, can I add something else? Um, I think it's just so amazing that um, he's able to teach them that their voice count, that the kids have freedom to speak. Uh, without awareness, I don't think that there is, uh, ignorance is what blocks everything that can be done in the, in the whole society. So um, when these kids are coming out of the ignorance, they know what is going on, and know who the president is, and know how to give their own opinion. Um, and not only that, but since they're little, they're building up um, a way for them to have a voice on the elections and to make sure that their voices count, that they are humans and that they count. Uh, I think that was just awesome. When I heard the kids, um, the way that they spoke, it's just, uh, uh, it makes me happy to know that, that in that age, they're able to freely say something without being uh, having fear that someone will shut them down and say, no, you can't say that, that's our president. So that was that was amazing. I, I just want to make the comment. <laughs> I agree. Well, I've got a couple more questions to consider and um, you know, the, the questions on that I had on the slide were what storms were present in the lives of the students and families and teachers. And we've talked a little bit about that. Um, and in what ways does the school provide safety and rest from the storm? And, and we've gotten to that too. So in our last, just like two minutes, um, what I want you to maybe consider, and you can just think of it or share it, we don't have too much time, but you know, what storms are we experiencing right now, both individually and collectively? And then where do we find our still waters? How can we be that still water, that refuge, that place of peace for others? Um, and where do we find that for ourselves? Does anybody wanna comment on that or have a thought? Not, that's okay. I know Barbara has a couple of closing words, but I really appreciate your contributions and, and the time that you spent with us today. 
I can. I, I feel bad that I am the only one that is. Uh, I don't want to take the chance uh, from somebody else to take. But I think uh, collectively we have the pandemic, um, which affects us a lot. Um, another thing will be um, mental health. Um, we do not have enough probably access to it or knowledge as a community, uh, as a society and support like in money available to uh, make more programs or have more um, professionals. And individually I struggled a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it is very challenging for me to work, go to school and take care of my family right now with the pandemic. Um, actually the way that we had it before when pandemic was not here, I was able to set aside schedules to go in the evening to school, work full time during the day, doing volunteer work on Saturdays and in between my school in the evenings. Um, and all this just uh, came and changed my whole um, perspective of how can I work on all this. It's been very tough because the challenges of technology um, support, personal support, which I, I, I love to talk like when I used to go to your center. I, I love to know that even if I just sit down on a place where my family is not screaming here, they're not demanding the meals, they're not asking for these questions and work is not. So it, it, it was just that personal space that I had in there where I could just go and use the computer and know that I, that I have a safe place to go. And I felt it like that and I miss that so much. That uh, with that in mind, it, it doesn't mean that we are not able to overcome all this. Um, we, can, we can do it if we all walk together, I think, if we will all support each other. And if we, if we when, when one, I have several uh, classmates that tell me, oh, I'm quitting, that's it. I am not going anymore. If you, we only can just stay with them four to five minutes and tell them this, if you, we do this step together, Let's try again, I'm failing too. Let's try again. I, I, I'm not able to connect to the class. Let's try together, let's try. And if we walk together in all this, regardless whether it's a pandemic or, or whatever it is, uh, and we support each other and we have that backup, I think we can do it and we can make it as a society too. Not only a group of students, not only 25 to 30 people, but, um, we can work together and, and make a difference. Oh, thank you, Noemi, I appreciate that. Barbara? So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Naomi, especially for helping us to see parts of the message that we may have missed without your encouragement and discussion. Great questions. Um, I love the way that you had things set up for us to consider those before we even saw the discussion. I trust that everybody here, as we continue our journeys throughout journeys throughout life. Um, we'll use those, remember those sunflower seeds in the, in the documentary? Use those seeds that were planted by this documentary and allow them to continue and grow and form perspectives that will help us with decision making, with um, stress relief, and with all of our interactions with others. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank our technical staff who do many things behind the scenes to make this a smooth presentation for us and the library personnel who work really hard, um, especially now during the pandemic to see how we can get these things done remotely. So thanks to everybody. I wanna remind you, it's been mentioned before, but in one week, our opportunity and civic responsibility to vote will have passed. It, it will be Wednesday. So this is just one more reminder that your city, your county, your state, and your country need your vote. Every governing level can impact our access to quality education, avenues of information, and overall community well-being. If you haven't done so already, please vote. If you have already voted or are not eligible to vote,
please encourage others and consider assisting those who may need support to participate in this very important civic right. Jason, could you put up the evaluation slide, please? There's that address. We also have it in the chat. We would love to get your feedback at mccneb.edu slash IIE eval. You do not have to list your name and contact information, but if you'd like to be considered for recognitions for continued attendance, we do need you to list it there. And then the final slide, we'll sh we are sharing with you our next program in the Diversity Matters Lecture Series, which is coming up quite soon, Monday evening, November 16th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. We will enjoy a presentation by Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, PhD from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, who is going to present what genealogies reveal, slavery, race, and the making of American gynecology. This is one of the presentations that we had to delay from spring when um, all of us went home or most of us went home to remote learning and we didn't quite have our feet on the ground yet to do the uh, virtual presentation. So we hope you'll join us on Monday evening, November 16th. And I wanna thank everybody again. It was um, great to see the good attendance and have a good afternoon.